So welcome back to our conference, Educating the Next Generation of Leaders. Um, next up for our second and final session, we will be delving into the topic around future-proofing your career, specifically around the future of work. So before we start, please write your um, in the chat your name, where you're from again, uh, and what you're looking to get out of today's session so that our speakers can also get to know you as well. As industries embrace automation, today's skills will not match the jobs of tomorrow, and newly acquired jobs can quickly become obsolete. So to be able to stay ahead of the curve and constantly re-educate yourself is the mark of a modern day specialist and a modern leader. So learn today how modern day specialists from firms like PwC, Mercer, and JLL have created future-proof careers from, for themselves and how you can also use non-linear learning frameworks to strike a balance between technical, business, and other soft skills. So I'm going to introduce our second moderator who's going to be hosting this panel session. Um, we have Alice Sue. So Alice is a technical leader and entrepreneur she is the co-founder of Transhumanism Australia and other health and genomics um, startups. As a software engineer, Alice has diverse experience developing products for AI and blockchain startups, as well as large banks and insurers. So Alice is also the board member of Singularity University Australia. So I'm going to now um, bring Alice onto the stage. Hi, Hello, Alice. everyone. Hello. So I will, I will um, hand the stage over to you as you introduce um, the other speakers. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lily. And welcome everyone to a fantastic session on future-proofing your career. So just as a brief introduction into this topic, it is widely or has been widely reported in the media lately about how the rapid advances in machine learning and robotics could potentially replace or even change a large proportion of existing human jobs. And then we've also got the pandemic and the pressures of that, which has pushed companies to adopt new technologies to lessen the reliance on real life people. But today isn't about automation, it's about the people and our ability to adapt on an ongoing basis. And today we have experts here who will share how they've created a future-proof career for themselves and how you can also apply the lessons learnt. So please, as we're going through this amazing discussion tonight, please add your questions and we'll do our best to get to the majority of them in the second half of this session. So with pleasure, I'd like to introduce the panelists for tonight. We have Carolyn Chin Parry, who is the Managing Director and Digital Innovation Leader at PwC Singapore. Carolyn also sits on the board of Equal Arc and the Australian Institute of Company Directors and a number of other organisations. Secondly, we have Ben Hamley, who is the Asia Pacific Lead of Future of Work at JLL. And he's responsible for creating a strategic design framework that helps JLL's clients and partners to change why, how, and where they work around the world. And in my opinion, it's never been more relevant than ever. And lastly, we have Sarah Till, who is the Singapore Public Sector and Job Redesign Practice Leader at Mercer. Sarah has a diverse background and is currently seconded to the World Economic Forum as a fellow for the Future of Work Initiative based in Geneva. So I'm very excited for tonight's discussion on future proofing your career. And so I'd like to start with this question to the panel. What emerging future of work trends do you see happening or have already seen happening in your own companies? And how can people pick up transferable skills to adapt to these changes? I'm happy to take a stab at that. <laughs> I think uh, like most companies, uh, there is um, a lot of opportunity to work from home, but we were quite lucky at PwC because we actually already had um, the collaboration tools in place. So when it was you know, quite sudden notice from various territories and countries um, to suddenly have to work from home, uh, we were lucky enough to be prepared for that. Um, I think also we note that um, not everyone is in that position. Um, there are people who may have, um, you know, 
Wi-Fi uh, connection issues from home, sometimes not always having the right uh, devices and so forth, maybe people outside of PwC or sometimes even within PwC, uh, just depends on which countries it is and so forth. So I think we're quite um, mindful about uh, digital inclusion during this period because um, a lot of people have been caught out uh, quite last minute. And also, even though that we, you know, we're kind of moving towards a new normal or a better normal, um, for example, not everyone has that ability to, to move as quickly and to, with the times as well. So um, being able to do digital upskilling um, in the nonprofit sector has been something that has been very humbling, to be very honest. Um, so being able to help about, you know, 300 professionals in that particular area, which tends to have very limited budget as well as um, sometimes limited capability as well to no fault their own. Um, it's something which has been quite eye-opening, but also something which uh, we're very mindful about. Fantastic points around the digital divide and how we need to be more inclusive as well. Are there any other points you'd like to add, Sarah or Ben? Yeah, sure. I might take, um, build, build on what uh, Carolyn was just saying. And I think it's really interesting to have seen how much of an impact it's had on so many different companies. From JLL's point of view, we, we manage about 4.6 billion square feet of space on behalf of other occupiers, other companies. And so we see so much of the edge of work in so many different industries. And what has been the most resounding trend over the last um, half a year has been how prominently emotional intelligence and transformational leadership have become center stage in what is being asked of. Um, once upon a time, these were sort of nice to have. So if you had a bit of experience in, in that kind of space, it, it gave you an edge, um, but now they're the essential skills to manage a much more responsive organization and the way that you need to adapt to rapid and highly uncertain environments. So that's been a really interesting um, thing to have seen. Right, and um, adding on, I think this is really the perfect time to chat about this. So last week at the World Economic Forum, we held what we call the Jobs Reset Summit, and um, some of the videos are available online if you Google for it. Um, and we released a new white paper titled Resetting the Future of World Agenda. So the paper covers um, five imperatives for the future of work in a post-COVID world. And um, broadly, we see accelerated digital adoption, which is no surprise, and we expect that organizations will continue to simplify operating models, structure, and work, which requires us to pick up new skills. So we will explore more as we dive deeper into today's session. Fantastic. And I think this is a good segue into the next question. So, um, Sarah, given your prior experience working in HR, I know you're particularly passionate about helping people achieve career longevity. So what are some things that people should do to achieve this? Yeah, um, and I think we see this, um, you know, from a few different perspectives. Like, And I want to, like, touch upon what various groups of people can do in order to kind of create what we call career longevity. So, for example, for individuals like you and me, you need to recognize that career longevity comes with skills longevity. So this means that you need your skill sets to be relevant for the future, and we need to think about building skill sets across two categories. Um, the first being what we call a core set of skills, um, such as problem solving, digital literacy, communication, as these are underlying skills that we need regardless of the jobs we choose. In, that, in, in addition to these core skills, we need to then blend it with what we call functional skills required for the job. So, for example, coding for programmers, advertising for marketers, etc. I think the key takeaway here is for individuals to adopt what we call active learning as both a skill and a mindset. So being able to then understand what is your own personal learning style, identify the most appropriate learning methods and design ways to integrate work with learn. So, and I want to also be able to move on to employers because I don't think it, it, the whole ecosystem will work with just employees taking on new skills. I think from an employer's perspective, we need to be able to facilitate career transition opportunities for the employees that comes in various forms. I think one, by adopting um, a forward-looking view on how jobs are expected to change and create those upskilling opportunities for the employees. Um, subsequently, we need to think about adjacencies and move employees into other roles within the organization to help them acquire new skills. 
And um, at Mercer, through our client experience, we observe there's an interest amongst clients to explore the idea of introducing what we call a talent marketplace. Um, the idea is to really share resources across functions, provide job rotation opportunities, and I was very fortunate to be given such opportunities myself. Um, and beyond what we can do internally as an employer, um, we hope to see more employers and considering the possibility of what we call an external redeployment. Um, the idea is to then help us build an ecosystem where we allow different employers to come together to cross redeploy their people to other organizations. We are seeing some great examples during the COVID period. So for example, in Singapore, we see flight attendants being um, allocated to hospitals or other industries. Um, in Argentina, there was also a collaboration established between General Motors and Unilever, where um, General, General Motors employees were redeployed between um, to, to Unilever during the COVID surge so that um, you know those people keep their jobs, they get paid, um, and we don't lose people in, in the employment system. So I believe that the outlook to grow the redeployment system is positive. I really do hope more employers come forward to do so. And my last point here being, um, in order to ensure that we build this thriving and sustainable redeployment ecosystem, the initiatives need to be supported by other organizations and stakeholders, such as um, governments, learning providers at U campus, um, so that we provide um, you know, the relevant, appropriate social support for people to do so, and we have the right content to transit into other careers. I love that you differentiate between the core skills and the functional skills and how you also mention cross deployment as a potential way to achieve career longevity. And so, uh, Ben, your LinkedIn profile describes that you love to work at the boundary of disciplines. So what does that actually mean for you and what can others do to adopt your approach? Um, yeah, thank you. It's something actually that I picked up when I was back in uni. A lecturer of mine um, told me something along the lines of the people who will be successful in the future will be the people who specialize in not specializing. Um, and that, that stuck with me. And throughout my career, which actually started in the fine arts, I have to say, I was originally trained in lighting design and events and sound design. Um, but through that, actually found that uh, the types of people who managed productions or entertainment, um, the types of producers, in fact, that were making these uh, shows come to life were incredibly multidisciplinary. They could speak the language of the directors and the actors, but also get very technical, follow budgets, manage very complex moving shows um, with highly contingent workforces. And I think um, as I got a little older, maybe not so much wiser, but somewhat more future focused, I realized that I needed to find a way in which my career um, could, didn't just have to rely on doing lighting design. It's not a very sustainable area. So um, what I ended up doing was looking for the, the closest fit I could find. Um, I ended up doing an MBA, but um, what I've found over the um, successive roles that I've held is that every job you have gives you a little bit of exposure to maybe a different edge. For example, if you're working in an education business, you start to get an insight into the frontiers of research, maybe science and technology. You may go from that into science and technology. And in that space, you may be then exposed to commercialization, therefore business model innovation um, and entrepreneurship. And you may go from that into some other role. Um, myself, I went from lighting design to education, to strategy, to a museum role uh, where I was doing audience research. And now I work for a commercial real estate business. So on paper, um, it doesn't make any sense. But when you follow the, the adjacencies, I think as Sarah was saying before, uh, in what the skills actually are and how they're related, um, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and in fact, my wife has a similar story. You know, she started out as a, as a nurse. Um, was one of the youngest clinical nurses um, in Queensland at the time uh, and then went from that to actually pivot into doing health service design consulting at PwC. So um, you find these pockets of um, brilliance in the way people find new ways to apply their knowledge to a need in society everywhere you look. Ben, I love that you have moved through several different industries from lighting, education to real estate now. And so 
Actually, Carolyn, I've noticed in your own crew, you have also moved across multiple industries and disciplines, including change management, digital and innovation. And that's just the name of few. So what advice can you give to other people who are trying to broaden their own career prospects? I think it's really about having an open mindset and a growth mindset, which kind of picks up elements of what uh, Ben and Sarah ha has mentioned earlier. It's really about being able to be a, a big sponge that absorbs everything. If you think about a young child who's about three years old, they learn everything so quickly because the mindset's actually really open. And unfortunately, over time, sometimes it's through education, sometimes it's about environmental factors. We start becoming less creative. We start absorbing less, actually. And um, in some ways, we need to retrain ourselves to actually open that mindset again. Um, I've shared this a few times before, and I'll share it again, um, which was that, uh, a few years ago, I actually had a life-changing coffee moment with a former colleague of mine. At a point in time, he was heading up the CIO advisory for one of the big four consulting firms. And I said to him, you know, how do you keep up with all these technology changes, advancements are just way too fast, blah, blah, blah. And he just basically said to me, oh, Carolyn, um, that's only a very simple answer, which is um, I read one hour a day. And I wasn't really expecting that um, response. Um, because on one hand, it sounded really simple, but on the other hand, to integrate that into my everyday life would be really challenging because like many people, I have a full-time job, I sit on a few boards, I have a couple of young kids at home and so forth. And and so you know, I kind of just think, gosh, I only have 24 hours a day, I wish I had 50. Um, how do I make this happen? And believe it or not, I really challenged myself. And um, what I did was I pretty much I used a few different things, but just to give one idea, I pretty much used um, LinkedIn and started following a whole bunch of thought leaders, following a whole bunch of magazines that I really want to follow, maybe publications from um, different journals from information systems to um, Harvard Business Review, the e-commerce and so forth, um, as well as different tech companies and all that. So all of a sudden, I've just taken what was you know, might be useless information on LinkedIn and started curating that information into, uh, I guess, a, a specifically designed magazine that's free for me. And um, what I do is that, you know, in the mornings, I, I'm a slow riser. Um, so I might just lay in bed for a little while, but that means I, I have a quick 10, 20 minute read of something. Um, and other times it could be, um, you know, a quick lunch break where I'm reading something. Um, if you're taking a train into work, that's when you can read. Um, you know, I would sometimes wait for my husband and kids to fall asleep and then I continue reading again. Um, and, you know, there's just so many options right now where there's online courses for free. You don't really have to pay a lot of money for them. A lot of them are indeed free. You don't always have to finish all the courses either. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't commit to something, but sometimes it's okay to have a broad general view of many different things without really completing it because sometimes you might go, okay, I've read, read as much as I want to read. I think there's another topic I want to move on to and that's okay as well. So I think it's really having that mindset to be open to different perspectives, even if people um, have a different perspective to you, or even if you disagree with it, I think it's really good to be able to listen to the resistance sometimes because there's value in understanding where the per perspectives are from. And sometimes there is um, learnings in that as well. I love that you mentioned the growth mindset and having an open mindset, just as when we're young, we, we are thinking about growth and we're very open to new ideas. I also love the tip about reading one hour per day. And I've noticed that people in the audience have actually recommended some books. So that's fantastic to see. So also, if anyone has any questions, please just type in the chat and we'll try and get to it towards the end. Or there's also an ask a question section, I believe. And I think we have some questions pouring in already. So we'll definitely get to them in a bit. All right. So for the next part, this is actually a good segue from the having an open mindset. So this is about how conventional expectations is that you're born, then you go to school and then you graduate, you get a job and then you climb the corporate ladder. I mean, that is the case for a lot of people here, I'm going to assume. But no one really talks about the non-linear career paths. So what are the benefits of having a diverse range of experience? Um, 
a diverse range of experience provides you know one with broader and more unique perspectives that's very intangible i say that you know really just reflecting on my own career journey as well it's very difficult to quantify the dollars and cents like if you were to, like ask me what is the roi i don't know but um you know i would say that the experience i've had so far it's all very very important to me um, for example, you have a better appreciation of the different challenges in rolling out new processes, say from a regulatory point of view, from a sales point of view, and from an operational point of view. And that experience really comes where you start to do it. Um, and it requires you to you know, be open, to be exposed um, across different functions. Um, however, I really do want to recognize that as a society, we are gradually gaining interest to move towards nonlinear paths. But there are very practical challenges that we need to prep ourselves for and address. So, for instance, I want to chat about two personas. I think um, if you were to dive into the first persona, a middle-aged professional, married with children, um, have worked hard to be at a certain level in a corporate career, may have aspirations to switch careers, but do not have the skill sets to do so. Um, so this really means that he or she will need to make certain financial sacrifices in order to get a foot in the door. But um, there are guilt, there are concerns due to family obligations. The question here really is how can we build the mindset to be ready for that potential trade-offs when such situations arise? And um, you know, and if we are ready to take the leap of faith when the time comes. And if we were to look into a second persona, a silver age employee, close to retirement or retired, minimal financial burden so unlike uh, the middle-aged professional where they don't care much about pay ready to take on a different career but they experience challenge of securing another job due to certain perceptions of uh, mature workers such as digital savviness productivity ability to work well with younger employees i think the point here is we need to understand that there is that interest to pursue but we also need to address some of these perceptions and challenges that we are actually experiencing as um, you know, employees in the current workforce. Mm -hmm. I might add on to that, that there's a real um, alignment to personal purpose and passion that companies need to be aware of these days as well, because I think increasingly the employee is the one selecting the company, not the other way around, even though the companies may be the ones putting the job ads out there. And so for an individual to have a breadth of not only skills, but also interests and um, passions or pursuits um, really brings to life that idea. You might have seen that intersecting diagram, the Venn diagram of Ikigai, where your sort of purpose or reason for being is at center. Yeah. Um, and I think if you have that diversity of skills and experience and, and passions and pursuits, that gives you a much richer view of your working life and where your working life can find a fulfilling outcome. Um, but at the same time, most of the actual employment data seems to indicate that over the last 40 years, um, the majority of new jobs that are being created are being created in non-routine cognitive domains. That is things that aren't easily automated and require a large amount of knowledge work to be completed. Obviously the routine manual work is very easily ro ro uh, automated with robotics and to some extent even routine cognitive work. Um, some professional services, accounting and even law firms now are facing disruption from that space too, which I'm sure um, Carolyn can speak to in much more detail than me. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to, to take that on. Uh, but actually, at PwC, like many accounting firms, uh, you know, we are always being constantly disrupted. Whether we like it or not, we can't rest on our laurels. What happened the last 10, 20, 40, 50 years is not going to be the deciding factor how successful we're ever going to be moving forward. Um, in reality, I say this to my colleagues very frequently, that any fintech can come by at any point in time and start eroding um, our, our market share as well as our profits and our clients. Um, you know, and this can happen. It doesn't have to happen over night and it doesn't have to happen um, by just one company. It can be multiple eating 5% here, 10% there before you know it, you know, you're really um, last year's news. And and so we have actually embarked on um, a very serious digital upskilling investment into our company um, because we recognize that a lot of what that we do, whether it's in taxation, whether it's audit, all that can be automated. And so um, the, the investment is literally you know, a couple of billions of dollars in the US, B, B being the billions. 
And within Singapore alone, it's um, $10 million investment over the course of a couple of years. What this looks like is that everybody, just using the Singapore example, which is reflective of most other countries that PwC operates in. Um, so using the example, um, everyone goes through a digital academy that we have had. And initially, the digital academy was meant to be face-to-face. -face. I, I luckily went to the face-to-face -face version, um, but quite quickly, we had to then convert into the virtual digital academy, uh, where we actually had a rapid response team developed to help flip our face-to-face -face model into the digital model um, in terms of the style of delivery. Um, our teams, uh, everybody goes through, and I'm very proud to say that even rank and file, such as my wonderful personal assistant, um, who I love so much, has also gone through um, this academy. So she has done, she's done um, digital wrangling, data, sorry, data wrangling, um, data visualization, analytics, as well as RPA, you know, and I'm so proud that we invest not just at client-facing stuff, but everybody without any form of prejudice. Um, we also have a much deeper dive um, investment into what we refer to as a digital accelerator program. So we take talent from across the business, regardless of whether they have digital skills, um, to go into a deep dive immersive program where we invest a lot more into um, um, analytics, RPA, as well as AI, ML, um, and also give them the opportunity to um, disrupt our business. In fact, you don't have to be in this program to disrupt your business. Um, you know, we do have our innovation challenges um, and competitions uh, and so forth each um, time, as well as hackathons to help promote that level of innovation. I think ultimately, you know, just like every other large corporate that, you know, may have been successful before, we are acutely aware that um, this our past doesn't reflect our future and unless you're prepared to self uh, to, to actually invest in it at all levels including the senior levels and lead by example it's going to be very very difficult to um, just do this on your own so I think that you know having the ability to influence from the top from the sideways as well as the bottom the change management aspects um, to I guess disrupt ourselves both internally but also uh, reimagine what the future could look like for ourselves as well as the clients that we help so you know things that you don't normally expect PwC to do or actually already delivering it. So for example, we developed one of the first few contact tracing um, Bluetooth beacons at the start of the year. This was probably around the January, February period. You wouldn't expect the PwC to produce that. We also have been um, developing other new products such as a uh, market intelligence product as well as a market accelerator product whereby if you are bricks and mortar and you had to go online, we can do that for you within 10 weeks. You know, which is also something you wouldn't expect us to do. Um, at the moment, we're also looking at um, some of the work that the creative agencies would normally do, and we actually do that as well. Um, so in that sense, you know, we are exploring um, what our business model look, looks like. And I, I'm saying this to actually not so much promote PwC, but to actually encourage other large firms to really think through because you're larger, less nimble, probably more bureaucratic, that you really have to start thinking through what your new business models are going to be and actually give people some flexibility to try new things and actually reward failure, which is very difficult to do in Asia and even more difficult to do in a post-COVID budget, but actually reward failure because only through failure can you learn fast. And, you know, to me, that's something that we need to really change the mindset of employers as well as bosses because that's something that's really needed in this world right now. Absolutely yeah, agree. I uh, it's a really great point, Carolyn, and something that come, came to mind before. And in fact, it was um, reminding me of something I think I saw in the comments as the conversation was going along as well around the connection between learning and innovation. And you mentioned that point around um, the emerging business models and how to uh, reward failure. And, and maybe, you know, I, I totally understand that idea that you're going for there. And the way that I've started to see it conceptualized now is almost uh, almost a flip, like incentivizing the learning that you get. So we're not, we're sort of shifting it away from referring to it as a failed experiment and looking at it as a source of new insight into what we've learnt. Um, and that is actually the bounty because when the conditions change as they have with COVID, it completely upends the assumptions that most of the old business models were originally based on. And if you follow the work of people like Steve Blank or Rita McGrath from Columbia Business School, you'll know that the heart of business model innovation is actually in the validation of those assumptions uh, around how you go about creating, delivering and capturing value. So in a sense, there is a really strong thread between how you learn as a company through the systematic validation of assumptions and the scientific approach to 
how you work and how your creativity is therefore applied in an innovative way to a new way of creating value or a new business model. And that's what I think uh, is, is probably the big opportunity now is to have this more structured, systematic way of doing that uh, learning throughout the work rather than coming out of the work, learning an institution, then coming back in again. Sarah, Caroline, anything to add to what Ben has just said? No, I just very much agree with what he's saying. <laughs> Fantastic. Likewise. So, Sarah, I loved how you talked about the two personas. I think that really helps us understand the challenges, but also the opportunities as well. I love how you talked about the ikigai, Ben, and how we should think about failure, not as value, but uh, as we traditionally thought about it, but as a source of insight. And then, Carolyn, you talked about digital upskilling and the program that PwC currently has. And one of those uh, areas that... Uh, are a focus for upskilling is data wrangling. Are there any other areas or skills that you've identified internally as particularly important for the upskilling process? Yeah, I think the truth is that people think about digital upskilling as, you know, oh, I don't want to have IT skills and I don't want to be coder. Um, that's actually not really the case of the whole purpose. It's actually really understanding that um, we do focus a bit on data, which I mentioned earlier, but because it's really the essence of everything, if you think about every other type of technology, whether it's robotics process automation, whether it's blockchain, whether it's AI, ML, if you don't have good quality data, all these technologies don't mean anything to you because it's you know the whole garbage in, garbage out side of things. Um, and I completely really resonate with what Sarah had mentioned. It's actually a combination of skills. So when I talk about upskilling, yes, there's all these uh, uh, you know digital elements to it. But in reality, we also advocate things such as um, being able to do design thinking workshops, where it's about workshop facilitation, thinking outside the box, um, bringing in the right stakeholders from multiple different areas to bring brainstorm on different ideas and challenge it, but also do validations around that. Um, so that really actually needs a lot of people skills, critical thinking, problem solving, those elements that Sarah had mentioned earlier. And, you know, when people ask me, well, what is the right way to upskill? Um, if I think about three broad categories, which kind of indirectly touches what Sarah had mentioned, it's about having um, business acumen, it's about having soft skills and it's about having digital skills. And when I say digital skills, once again, I'm not expecting a person to be an IT coder. It's actually understanding, regardless of whether you're a CEO, a board director, someone in the middle management, or someone starting their career, it's actually understanding what can, do I need to know about digital around risk? If you're a senior person, it's about governance. It's also about what can I do to disrupt myself and my industry such that I can actually be a serious layer and survive to thrive, you know, because it's actually about new business models that are going to be enabled through digital that we need to pay serious attention to. Now, it doesn't matter whether you work in a very old school kind of industry. So when I say old school, it could be something like a hairdresser. It could be something like a tailor, for example, where people's skills are still terribly important. But if you can see, you know, um, this whole COVID has shown us that even all these traditional people-centered jobs and roles that are important still, so can have a digital element. I wouldn't know a tailor was there if they're not on Google, for example. I wouldn't know how to get hold of a, a hairdresser and the right one if I don't have access to reading the reviews, for example. So, you know, the, whether we like it or not, the human factor is highly important, but I think digital helps with the as, as, uh, enabling part of things, and that's something to be mindful about. I hear you saying that soft skills and hard skills are equally as important. And so, Ben, I wanted to ask you about interdisciplinary learning. So how does that help people adapt to un an unknown future, if at all? Or do you have any success stories to share? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The, the real proof is in the, the actual jobs that are available today. What we see in the world of commercial real estate and workplace management is a shift, in fact, quite a quite a rapid shift from the job principally being that of managing the infrastructure or the real estate um, to over the last decade or so managing what you would refer to as the workplace, which also includes all the digital productivity tools and other elements of the virtual workplace. 
Um, and now it's shifted further still to human experience, which is much more adjacent to what Carolyn mentioned before around human-centered design, design thinking, um, these sorts of capabilities. And so to have a mix of capabilities, to have that sort of interdisciplinary mindset where you maybe have three or four circles that you can recombine to make your own career Venn diagram as, as suits you, and you can mix and match depending on the need at the time, will we'll actually give you a great source of advantage in potentially getting that job or better still, identifying the problem that a company you aspire to work for might be having and being able to come to them with a proposition for how you could solve it through the knowledge that you already have. Uh, in a sense, actually create the job rather than wait for it to get advertised. Because I, I do think there is a bit of a lag in industry in general between their recognition of what problem they have and their ability to spin up a recruitment drive to find the job description, go to market, find the person, an education institution respond to that being out there, start training a new person for it. Three years later, they're ready. Um, and in the meantime, everyone else is just kind of fitting the bits together. So, you know, really actually being able to see those crossovers ahead of time requires a whole nother set of skills like um, future thinking and uh, scenario planning and creative writing and um, much more imaginative skills perhaps than we would think of as a traditional business strategy or even data analyst type role that we might have been accustomed to if we'd been working in professional services for the last 20 years. So we see a huge convergence now between those types of people who manage human experience, um, both in the real Tap, uh, tangible sense of workplaces, like the offices that we deal with, um, and in fact, the industrial and logistics centers as well, and the human resources functions of an organization who have by and large been the primary coordinators of people's return to the office after COVID. And, and Sarah, thank you for um, mentioning JLL in your white paper as well. I know you, I think you spoke with our chief human resources officer, Mary, on that. Um, but also IT, and, and this is probably the last point of tying the dots together here that I'll make uh, without spending too much time talking, um, is that there's a huge amount of digital transformation still going on. And, and Carolyn will have much more insight into this, I'm sure, as well. But uh, what that actually means in the future is not just the technical types of digital that we're working on. It won't just be digital communication or digital technology infrastructure, but it'll actually be the full digitization of the company itself. So the type of strategy or leadership role that can command a company that is fully digitized is, a, is the type of leader who has this adaptive mindset of learning through experimentation and testing, but also has the ability to gather data from the business to get a read on how well it's performing and whether or not that's in tune with scenarios that are that may or may not be coming true. So in a way, the future of strategy is also the future of data analytics, as well as uh, sort of imaginative scenario planning. So all of those things sound like a, a cluster of um, skills that are completely unrelated to real estate, but they are in fact what are the majority of new roles that we're recruiting at the moment. So thanks for your thoughts, Ben. So you somewhat alluded to redesigning the job landscape and I really wanted to understand more about what, Sarah, you're doing at Mercer. How are you looking at redesigning the job landscape in Singapore? What are the main themes you can share with us? Sure. Um, the core of job redesign in Singapore is to ensure alignment of the job design, which comes in a form of tasks being allocated to the employees, both the organization and the industry's transformation ambition. So the keyword here really is all about relevance. Um, for example, if we think about the work processes that are being set up to help an organization roll a new business area, the question we need to ask ourselves is, are the employees then equipped with the skills to do so? Um, very conversely, for areas that are absolute, we want to also be able to ensure that the employees no longer perform those tasks as, you know, those tasks no longer add value to the business. Oftentimes, when we worked on our job redesign engagement, um, we start to really see employees taking on all of this task. And when you ask them, um, you know, why are you doing th this for? How does it contribute to your function or your business? Um, a large proportion of the time, the, the answer we got was, we actually don't know. 
And um, it really is also a testament of how um, changes that accumulated over the years. Whilst we, we are excited about adding new processes, new technology and new products to the organization, um, we don't pay as much attention to question the status quo. Is this process still relevant given that we are making this new investment? Or, you know, is this work still needed because, um, you know, we are no longer offering this product? Um, we spend less time doing that, asking those questions. And we actually find a lot of time spent on um, tasks that's no longer adding value. So, so I think that's the lens that we want to take from a productivity standpoint as well. Um, as we look to redesign the organization processes and work, we truly recognize, and I think um, you know, there's a lot of talk on technology already, that it plays an important role in the journey. We look for ways to embed technology with the intention to enable people not to disrupt processes. And, um, you know, there's always a common fear that people will lose jobs as a result of um, automation. But um, I think what we we, can, we don't pay enough attention on is, well, you know, I mean, it's going to save productivity, save time. It also create new job and new opportunities for people. Um, so the question is really, how do we encourage people to, to really embrace learning technology? Um, and exploit the use of technology, of course, in an ethical way, so that they deliver their work better. Um, we really hope that through the job redesign process, we equip employees with the right skill sets, gradually transition them into their own future of work journey, and giving them an opportunity to make a better living through their redesign jobs. I think you've brought up some really important points, including that technology is currently being used to enable people to perform better or faster or more efficiently at work. And so I actually wanted to go to some of the audience's questions. And one of them could be that, uh, let's just go start from the top. What are some of the good ways to learn by doing, especially for functional areas such as monetization, growth or marketing? I think we, we touched on this a little bit before. Um, I, when you thought, when you look at growth marketing uh, or monetization, commercialization, um, these things are all interconnected in the um, scaling of a venture, usually in entrepreneurship or, or new ventures. These kind of concepts will come together. Uh, and they tend to come together because these are the primary activities that are occurring at a, at a time when a business model is finding its product market fit and it's validating whether its customer segments actually need what it's producing, uh, whether it's feasible to produce in the given way and then sort of optimizing some of its supply chain to get the best um, profit margin out of what it's bringing to market. But ultimately that uh, learning that you're doing is, is the work. Um, so long as it's captured and codified correctly, it needs to be formulated as an experiment first so that what the assumption you are gathering evidence about can be proven or disproven and if it's and if it's not done like that um, unfortunately it's probably just tacit learning it's not created and documented and they're therefore becoming explicit um, and that's if you go all the way back to the early 90s even probably earlier than that um, the foundations of knowledge creating companies Ikujiro Nanaka's work on the knowledge creating company talks about that, that spiral where you connect tacit learning to explicit learning through that codifying journey. But it's only much more recently that we've started to think of it in terms of the lean startup or business model generation or um, agile or whatever you might call it. But ultimately it's the same stuff. It's just science. You're gonna put an experiment around it, get some evidence. Anything to add to that? And we'll go to the next question, which is, how do you strike the balance between building your own personal expertise and your ability to connect, collaborate or network? I don't see it as one or the other. <laughs> I think they're both very important regardless. I think that with um, personal expertise, it's really about what are you truly passionate about and what makes sense for your line of work that you've chosen. 
Um, and I think that always there is room to grow, no matter how, even if you're the world's top expert in your field, there's always room to grow and, and learn. Um, and I, you know, as I mentioned earlier about lifelong learning being very important and having that open mindset. Um, I think, you know, in terms of collaboration and networking, I really think that, look, if you have something that you created and it's really IP worthy that, you know, you need a pattern and all that, then of course you'd be quiet about that. But if it's just, you know, you, just for arguments that you're one HR professional versus another HR professional, even if you're in a competing company, there's so much you can learn from each other. You know, what what do what should Common Ben look like for the new world? Um, what does the young generation look like? How can we have a more inclusive um, you know, type of environment for our people. How do we add values to employers to the employee experience and so forth? There's nothing wrong collaborating and networking. And I'm so grateful that you brought up the word networking because I think that that's extremely critical in a person's career. I feel it's probably one of the most undervalued and critical things that a person needs to have. Why is that the case? Just for example, if you were unfortunate enough to lose a job today, a lot of jobs are actually not being advertised publicly your networks will help you connect to the right hiring managers. It, it, you, you never know who in your network knows who, which is a very small world. Um, I'll give you an example. Last year, um, when, just before I started PwC, I went for a job interview, and I said to the hiring manager, oh, you know, feel free to contact my references, blah, blah, blah. And his response to me was, oh, don't worry, we've already done all your background checks. Right. And um, he said, well, you used to work with my uncle 15 years ago in a different country. Who knew? And uh, one of my best friends knows you very well. <laughs> He's actually one of my mentors. So, <laughs> so you never know. It's such a small world. But it just meant that for this person, he kind of already knew who he was hiring before he even met me. Right. And sometimes it's that informal networking where you get the intels that are truly important. Um, but also, I think that there's so much to learn and grow. Um, the networks will help identify great uh, thought leaders, people who are good mentors, people who are good coaches. I'm a big fan of reverse mentoring. There's so much I can learn from somebody else from a different generation and different demographic. Um, so I think that this whole area around personal expertise versus collaboration. I don't see it as versus, I see end, personal expertise and collaboration because only together can we all grow, you know, as, as people and as, as professionals as well. Fantastic. So keep the questions coming. We'll continue answering them. And also you can upvote the questions that you want answered. So the next question from the audience is, what have you all found to be particularly effective at incentivizing failures, if not reframing them? From Benjamin Lowe. I think this is um, a good question and a very tough one. Um, like to what Carolyn has just spoke about earlier, um, you know, in some parts of our society, we're still not ready to embrace failures. Even personally for myself, I find it very hard to take. Um, at the same time, um, I, I see incentivizing it in different ways, but I do think about creating capacity for people in the team to fail and recognizing that it is a learning, it is not a failure. Every single project, every single work assignment, um, it always comes with learning, and there are there are always ways we can always do it better. So um, it's more about us as a group being more forgiving to ourselves because it's a difficult time. Um, more about being understanding to your colleagues when they have their learning moments. How do you share that and reflect that alongside with them so that you know you build a better product in the next version? So and um, you know similarly for leaders. Um, how do you also be able to create the capacity where the team feels okay that they learn from the process? And how do you then encourage those moments and give them the right coaching as needed? So this is how I see it. Yeah, I, I would add that um, there's some really interesting uh, work out there by someone whom my wife actually introduced me to. Uh, his name's Aaron Dignan, and he runs a company called The Ready. Uh, he wrote a book recently called Brave New Work. And in that, what he refers to, um, I guess, in a way, answering Benjamin's question here around reframing the way we think about failure, is that you essentially set it up as a possible outcome to begin with. So really, it's not a surprise. Therefore, it isn't what you would traditionally think of as a failure because what it was that you did in the first place was defined as something safe to try. And then if you can design all of your work in that way, 
so that what you do is safe to try and it's generally agreed that it is safe to try regardless of the outcome, um, then you can't fail. And the only thing that you'll get out of it is either the outcome you were trying to get, um, validated assumption or learning and an ability to pivot to something else faster. Mm. Uh, I'll draw an example from our PWC, a, a digital accelerator program. Um, everyone needs to actually develop their own so-called business missions, which is another fancy word of calling an innovation project. And um, a number of my people, my team had actually asked, oh, but, you know, what happens if, if it's not successful? Um, because we've never done this before. And I said, actually, that's not the point. And they said, oh, but I don't want to be marked down during my performance review, da, da, da. And I actually had to sit them down and actually, you know, explain what the innovation actually really means. You know, there are times where you try to discover and through your research, you realize that actually the technology is not ready. Other times you think you're going to go down the right track, but then you do the market validation and you realize that this is actually a really good product, but the clients are not prepared to pay for it yet. You know, so it does not mean that you have failed. You have actually explored and without the exploration, you wouldn't know. And if the, through the exploration, it's a, a roadblock or it's a showstopper, it's fantastic to know that. Um, and to me, that's not failure. Failure is actually not trying. So, you know, being able to help uh, a lot of employers um, who are a little bit more traditional to understand the purpose of feeling fast and giving something a try is actually very crucial. But I think we also tend to be our own worst enemies. We all are brought up to be successful, to be a straight A student and all, do all these wonderful things. But we're dealing with a very, very different world. And in this world, I mean, you can only see, you know, those all, all those wonderful, great innovators through time. How many times have they failed? Just think about it this way. You know, um, Walt Disney, guess how many times he went to a bank to ask for a loan to build Disneyland? He got rejected not 10 times, not 100 times, over 300 times he got knocked back and slapped by every other bank until one decided to, to, to take him on. The same way, you know, J.K. Rowling's who wrote Happy Potter, I mean, you all know how many rejections she had um, for, you know, uh, uh, with all the publishers that she went to. So I think that, you know, it's, it's really understanding your value that you bring. Um, there are times where the market's not ready. There are times where the technology is not ready. It doesn't mean that the idea was bad. It just means that, you know, it just didn't work at that point in time. But at that point in time doesn't mean always and forget ever it's not going to work. But also there are times where you do need to realize that um, it's always very good to socialize your ideas and get that validation, whether it's internal or external, just to be very sure that you're on the right track. There's, like I say, there's always wonderful things to be understood when you deal with people with a very different perspective. You might think it's a Rolls Royce or something and someone's going, look, it's worse than a bicycle. You know, so I think it's wonderful to understand, well, why do you think it's a bicycle? Which aspects of it do you think we should have improved as opposed to, gosh, I really hate this guy. He has no idea how hard I worked at it. <laughs> so once yeah, again, that's... having the open mindset to actually understand. It's such a good point, Carolyn. And I actually wanted to um, make a callback to um, Sarah's white paper as well, because there's an interesting part in that um, that I think really resonates with what you just described around helping to build understanding and shape options within the organization to get that collective wisdom, to get that collective knowledge um, into the way you make decisions. That intersection, um, I'm looking at it now, so I'll, I'll call it out. It's figure two on page uh, <laughs> five. But um, the intersection of work, workers and workplace. And I think this is a really interesting interesting one and a big challenge that we're dealing with at the moment at JLL because obviously so many people have been working remotely now for a number of months and in some cases maybe coming back to the office or even questioning the future value of the office um, completely, you know, whether or not it's even something they need, how many people will be in it and so on. Um, what we're finding is actually very interesting that once upon a time people used to work in the office that was the default and maybe work remotely if they had the portability and the security requirements that allowed them to do that but then when there was a key moment the company needed to consider like these conversations carolyn's talking about they would go off site there'd be a strategic retreat somewhere or there'd be a special event somewhere it's now actually flipped and the workplace or the office is the most important um, keeper of company culture and purpose and people will be coming in to that workplace to, to have these most important strategic conversations about the future of their company. Because it's now almost assumed or even validated as such that the majority of knowledge-based work can be done in some degree just in a distributed fashion. But the office isn't dead. In fact, it's just going to evolve 
perhaps using the space that was freed up from individual workstations to have more specific fit for purpose collaborative innovation spaces. Um, the likes of which, you know, PwC has in their experience center, um, JLL has in our NXT office facility, um, these kinds of cutting edge bespoke spaces that manage these strategic conversations effectively, I think will be far more commonplace in the future. Fantastic. And one last question from the audience. And this question is from Catherine. How can candidates who've been out of work for a long time, especially in an environment like this, present themselves in a way that makes them still competitive? Um, I think we, we, kind of, we kind of need to kind of take a, you know, stop chat of your own skills inventory. What are some of your most relevant skill sets you have gathered? I don't think it really matters that, you know, you, you have not been in, in a job. Um, for a long time, but I think it's about calling out the most relevant skill sets you have for the particular job you're applying for. And so so I think this is, um, yeah, to me, will be the most important part. I would say, um, once again, leveraging on your networking, which is really important. Um, sometimes being able to volunteer for a nonprofit sector actually keeps your skills very relevant. While you may not have a paid job, you're demonstrating to the employer you've taken a proactive approach to utilize the skill in a different environment and add value that way. Um, and also, you know, volunteering is the best of both worlds. If there's something on the CV that shows that you're doing something active, at the same time, usually they're flexible enough for you to go for your interviews. Um, and who knows, if you really add value, it's highly possible that a nonprofit could hire you in the meantime anyway. Um, and you might fall in love with that sector as well. Um, alternatively, if volunteering is not your thing, I think being able to upskill yourself in courses is good. So being able to say, look, I haven't been able to, to work, but during this time I've been actively learning. I've done this course, blah, blah, blah. From there, I've learned this. And maybe some of that learning, so you can actually share your perspectives and put it on LinkedIn as an article to share, you know, this is what I've been doing. I found these things. It's been new to me. When I reflect on my previous job in this industry, you know, I really see the value, blah, blah. And, and this is how you can actually make yourself highly attractive, even if you don't have a job. I tend not to discriminate people who haven't had a job. Um, sometimes it's through illness, um, being a caregiver, sometimes it's for maternity leave, whatever it might be. It's really understanding from that person's viewpoint as to, you know, what have you done during this break? You know, um, how have you demonstrated that you, you, you have still very relevant skills? Um, I must admit that I took... Um, I guess I was allowed to legally, I guess, when I was working in Australia to take two years break on maternity leave. But during that time, I was not ready to go back to the consulting world because clients want you there for, you know, 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week and that sort of thing. So that's going to be really hard, um, especially because I wanted to breastfeed my child and so forth. And and so um, so what I actually did was I actually went into teaching at university part time during that period of time to keep myself mentally stimulated. But during that time, I actually worked with a lot of um, academics who are in research where I learned a lot of different things and also um, did a little bit of public speaking. But what I could do was demonstrate to the employer that during this time, you know, I, I worked in a different environment. It was in research. It was in, um, you know, teaching. Um, and, you know, I was able to refresh myself during this period because I wasn't working crazy hours. I'm more recharged. And, you know, being a mother has taught me um, exactly what excellent time management and multitasking actually means. You know, and the best people who are great project managers, great um, conflict negotiators, sometimes are actually parents. <laughs> it doesn't mean that if you're a non-parent, you're no good. But I think it really pushes your boundaries in many ways. And sometimes employers forget about those elements. So I think having the courage to speak up and, and share, you know, how you've taken that break and really maximize yourself in new ways is actually very excellent. Anything to add to that? I think it's a really good, I can relate to it. I have a seven month old and a three year old and uh, the managerial skills are testing me. So, <laughs> Well, I've really enjoyed this conversation and unfortunately we're running out of time, but I do have one last question to the panel. So in uh, very quickly, how are you preparing yourself for the future of work? 
I am doing a couple of things. Um, I see myself as having potentially up to two to three parallel careers right now. Um, and I'm upfront with it. I think my bosses all know anyway. Um, so um, my day job is, you know, working at PwC and doing what I can in that area. Um, when I say parallel careers, it's not necessarily having an everyday other job. Um, sometimes it's just uh, a little bit of uh, experience, sometimes it's training and so forth. So um, part of it could be building up a board directorship career, which I'm already doing in the nonprofit sector. Um, the other is potentially looking in academia as well. So I have worked um, in advisory boards for some of the universities as well as been a lecturer in the past. So um, I kind of see myself as, you know, possibly consulting still, possibly a board director, possibly an adjunct professor. Um, but also understanding for myself what skills do I need if I want to pursue those other parallel careers and it's a slow drip feed learning and growing those skill sets it doesn't have to be a big wham bang 10 hours a week type of thing which is quite hard for us to do if you're working full time um, so for me it's really about making being very clear what I'm passionate about, having the foresight to kind of, well, I don't think I have always the great foresight, but going, okay, what do I, where do I see, you know, next 10, 20 years for me? Um, I'm actually very mindful, and I hate to say this, that sometimes it can be quite an ageist society. I'm in my 40s, um, that perfect, you know, mid-career retrenchment kind of person. Um, thankfully, I have an employee who is not doing any retrenchments, but it's one of those things which I'm really mindful about. Um, and it's also going, well, okay, where do I think I could add value? And if it was a horribly ageist society 5, 10, 15 years from now, which other careers could I have that would actually value my experience? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> thinking about what the future looks like is probably the most important and only way that you can really prepare your um, yourself to be future proof. Um, at JLL, we've just recently developed and published a reimagined framework, which essentially deals with the 15 different dimensions that requ are required to be considered to effectively develop future scenarios for how your company might be working and, and integrates not just where you work in terms of an office, but how you work in the organizational design sense, and in fact, why you work and what sort of work is required in those future possible scenarios. And then as you work backwards from those possible futures, you develop a set of um, data points on what must be true for one of those scenarios to be coming true. Now, if you have that, it's much easier to track over time in smaller increments. And so it's much easier to make it small adjustments if you're steering the ship in small ways. Um, you stay closer to the course than if you make major course corrections maybe once every three or five years in your career. Um, and really, I think the way we're thinking about it now is uh, not just the physical place where you put your people and your things, um, but the, the platform, in effect, as companies become even more digital, this uh, metaphor of the operating system of work becomes a, a, a real crossover with um, real estate. And so what we see now is that real estate and the world of work is becoming increasingly digital. And therefore, to prepare for the future, we need to be thinking about where, how and why we work as this kind of operating system. And the pe people who have those skills um, will be the ones that are much more ready to lead that future. And personally, for me, um, it's, it's a point that I've been advocating for a long time. Um, I spent a little bit of time reflecting on what is my own personal learning persona, my personal learning style. Um, we see that there is, you know, really a lot of learning content out there. I wouldn't be surprised any organization is subscribing to Linking Learning edX, and there's a lot of content out there. Um, however, I don't know if we have spent enough time reflecting on our, ourselves on what is the most optimal learning method for, for you. Some could be you know, practical, some could be, you know, like to Caroline's point earlier, some, some really learn very well by just reading. Um, and I would actually encourage everyone to kind of take that reflection for yourself so that you chart your own learning um, program. So for example, for me, I know that, you know, I learn the best by applying, by gathering new work experience. I'm a big fan of experiential learning. So I'm always up for the next problem to be solved and I will continue to do that. So, so that's me, but you know, there are people who are great at, you know, reading and applying. There are, there are other people who, who are great at just, you know, going through a discussion and learning through what other people are sharing, like what we are doing today. So. Find out what works best for you and then apply that on your job. So 
Fantastic. Thank you so much for your insights. We'll have to hand it back to Lily to wrap up. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone.